Is there anybody I'm missing? Actually, yeah. it's, oh, it's a peony. Got it. Okay. Tell you what, why don't we go ahead and get started since it is three after the hour? It's a A instead of I in the second place. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I, I didn't miss typing that all over the place. I apologize. It's um, fine. Uh, where was I? We lost a train of thought. Okay, here we go. Three after, let's go ahead and get started. Um, one thing I forgot to mention actually ages ago is if you guys can't make the call because of public holiday, let me know because I do treat those differently than just you're being a slacker and going on vacation. Um, I do count the, uh, uh, official holidays as still present so that way you don't lose voting rights because of it. And in fact, if you have a lot of vacation, like some of you guys in Europe have, you actually may gain voting rights because of it. So I didn't want you guys to be penalized because you're on vacation or because of holidays. So just let me know. For example, Vlad and Clemens today are tagged with that. Luckily, I don't think it matters much because we don't actually do votes very often and usually they're landslides when we do vote. So anyway, just let you guys know that uh, you should let me know. Um, all right, so let's talk about some AIs first of all. Um, Thomas had an AI to talk about when we do or do not need the content type, uh, the, the cloud event content type attribute. The spec now has this text in here that in my opinion covers it, but I wanna make sure you guys are okay with me closing this action item. So I'll give you guys a second just to read that. Is there anybody who disagrees that we can close this action item and that this bit of text in the spec covers it? Okay, cool. Um, now Michael, I believe his last name is Payne, hasn't been on the call in a very long time and he actually, admits, uh, volunteer to do some investigation to open census, but unless somebody on the group wants to volunteer to pick up that work, I'm inclined to close this, this action item. Does anybody wants to volunteer or object to that action? Okay, I'll do that then. Uh, Jules, I believe he was from Docker. He was gonna write a proposal for Benchmark Framework, but he's basically hasn't joined any of our calls in quite a long time. So I'm gonna uh, try to see if I can reach out to him, but otherwise, um, if I don't hear back from him, I'm just gonna close his action item because I think he's kind of vanished. Um, and then finally, Scott. Rachel had an AI for adding some additional text around the subject PR. Um, if you're so inclined, maybe you could ping her to find out what that was about, because I honestly can't remember. But if I can't, if we don't hear back from you or her, I'd like to just sort of close this action item and assume that we don't need it. Is that okay with you? That sounds great. Okay, cool, thank you. And I think that's it in terms of action items we can deal with. Um, next, is there any objection to canceling the call on the July 4th? I know it's not a holiday for everybody, but I think enough US folks will be absent that uh, we may not have quorum. So is it okay to cancel July 4th for everybody? All right, cool, thank you. All right, community time. Is there anything from the community people would like to bring up? Oh, I'm sorry, Jude, your hand's up. What is a benchmark AI? I think this was, um, I'm trying to remember. We were at a face-to-face -face and Jude showed up and I believe Docker wanted some sort of framework to test whether serverless implementations adhere to something. The fact that it says benchmark leads me to believe it wasn't uh, functional, it was more performance related, but I honestly cannot remember. But he was supposed to come back with a proposal to actually explain what he was looking for and he never did. But wasn't this a benchmark against uh, the various different uh, functions as a service uh, implementations? Maybe, I honestly don't remember. Oh, okay. But the yeah, fact I, think, that, I think it was the face-to-face -face in San Francisco um, at the Google office. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. But the fact that they, they basically vanished and haven't mentioned this since then leads me to believe that it doesn't, it's not as a high priority for them anymore. I, also, I don't think that it was related to cloud events as much as it was to, func to uh, serverless. That may have been true too. Yeah, it may have been more of an action for the serverless work group, yeah. So anyway. All right, um, last chance. Anybody have a community issue you want to bring up? No, but I'd like to comment on the open census one. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, open census in itself is probably not very related to cloud events as it's a library for actual, actual libraries for collecting metrics and traces, but we have a distributed tracing extension, but is there any 
um, guidance as to the metrics that the SDK should support, as I, I guess the SDK should support collecting metrics. I don't know. Anybody else in the SDK team want to talk to that one? Because that's the one part of open census that is not com commented on anything anywhere, I think, in cloud events. Yeah, that is true. I don't know. Let me, let me pick on some people. Mark or Scott, you guys have any comments on that? We use open census in the SDK for Go, but not over the data plane. So we don't make a choice about like injecting a, a trace ID into the header. Do you think this would be a cloud event thing or is this more of an implementation detail of an SDK? This is not even the SDK. Potentially you could say, uh, I support first class this concept that I'm gonna inject uh, on the on the transport a trace ID, I support the cloud events trace ID uh, extension, but that's different than exposing that through open census. Does that answer your question, Davini? Uh, yeah, I wasn't actually talking about the tracing that much as I said, it already has the extension and I don't think we can actually do that like generically, but usually at least the libraries I work with have taken the responsibility of collecting basic metrics about their functionality and exposing those to the application using the SDK. I would find it weird if the Cloud Events SDK did not at some point include metrics that you could then expose, for example, for in a Prometheus endpoint in your application. Um, you, of course, can do it yourself. It, that's, I just have never seen that as a pattern. Oh, yeah, so so I did, I'd agree that I think this is more of an SDK issue. Yeah, it is a completely an SDK issue in my mind. Uh, I just think that since we have SDK guidelines, if, if they, some of them do support metrics for the events, I think they should probably be the metric uh, tags or names or whatever you want to call them, labels should probably be standardized in the SDK gui guidelines so that they aren't dependent on language. Would you like to open up a pull request to add that text to the SDK doc? Oh my. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you get for speaking up. <laughs> yeah, that's what I get. Um, maybe we'll see. I think I should. Well, say hey, what? Doug, uh, was, was there an actual uh, GitHub PR or issue for this action item, or was it just a, on an on call? It was, on a, it was just on a call. We never opened up an issue or anything around it. All right. I might uh, ping Michael and see what he was thinking about it. Okay, that'd be great. Let me do this. Uh, okay. Um, so it's been, I'll, I'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. It, it's, it's not critical, especially for 1.0, it's because as I said, you can do that just as well yourself. As, yeah. Like it's not required for the SDK. I just find it weird if it wasn't on the roadmap even. Yeah, okay. All right, moving forward, um, SDK stuff. I know we haven't had a phone call. There probably isn't anything to say there other than we will have a call right after this one for 30 minutes uh, as best we can. I know Clemens obviously can't make it. He's out, um, but yeah. Mark, Scott, or anybody else working on SDKs, we can, we can meet up because I know there were some topics. Actually, uh, Klaus, I think you had a topic you want to talk about too. Um, KubeCon is next week. Um, the slides are available. If you guys have any comments, please let me know. And just a reminder, for those of you who have endpoints, keep your demos or your endpoints up and running. I will be doing a demo or trying to do a demo on Tuesday afternoon, China time, which is probably Monday evening over here in the States. Uh, let's see, going forward. All right, incubator. We had started a vote last week. I think there was one person who questioned whether we should go for incubator status. So we, um, because it wasn't unanimous, we started a vote. Um, so far, everybody voted offline, voted yes. Um, is there anybody um, on the call? Well, is, I don't think anybody's going to object. So let me just ask this way. Is there anybody who objects to going forward with incubator status? Okay. So we'll just do that. Much easier that way. Okay. So 
The next step in the process, as far as I understand it, is, is to put together a formal proposal, which is, I think, just a PowerPoint deck um, for the TOC. I think um, I can take that action and start putting that together, and then you guys can obviously review it and help tweak it. The biggest ask I have of you guys is to start uh, giving me end users that we can uh, use to satisfy the requirement of proving that we have at least three end users who are using our spec. So offline, uh, drop me a note <clears throat> about who your end users are or you know, who's willing to claim as an end user that they, they're okay publicly saying that they, they use cloud events or your product that uses cloud events, okay? And I'll let you know when the proposal is ready, up, ready for you guys to review. And then I'll get on the TLC agenda when, we're, when we have all the data. All right, anything about those topics? All right, moving forward. Um, um, so, oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one thing, just I, I think it's been quite hard to find names for these three end users listening to the calls for the past few months. Um, I think a big part of that is the fact that the spec is clearly changing a lot in V0.3 and maybe in 0.4. There's been a lot of changes. And mm -hmm. for example, we haven't um, implemented cloud events for it, that reason. And we will be implementing them as soon as I'm fairly convinced that the spec is not changing a lot anymore. Yeah, yeah. So and that makes sense. That will, will get a lot easier, yep. like in some weeks when we get open three out at least. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I, um, I actually suspect we may not have that many issues finding them because I know that there are some products out there that, that use it today. I mean, all you gotta do is find a user of, of venting in Knative and you can, as long as they're willing to put their name out there publicly, that'll count because Knative uses uh, cloud events. So I think, I think we'll be able to do it. I just need to people to give me names, basically. What exactly is an end user here? It's, it's the user of a product that supports cloud events. So the fact that a product supports cloud events is not sufficient. It has to be a user of the product. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, all right, V1.0 discussion. Not a whole lot to talk about here other than I was using this sort of track how things are going. So just a reminder that there are five issues out there that need uh, PRs associated with them or a proposed to, proposal to close them. Um, these four people or five people, I guess, um, are sort of owners of those issues or volunteer to do something. I know, for example, Christoph, you volunteered to help Scott out. And um, I was hesitant to put your name here, but since the PR isn't there yet, I thought I'd just use as a reminder for everybody um, that we are waiting for PRs or some sort of resolution of those issues. Those are just the V1 issues. Um, and there are two, uh, sorry, go ahead. Do, do you have the issue about the headers and the map encoding for this call on the agenda? Sorry, I don't have it open. Uh, it might be. Um, oh no, it's okay. It, it, I, I think it's, it's it's down there. <laughs> yeah, it's down there. Yeah, yeah. It it there. I I do. Yeah. Obviously, okay. if you guys don't like the ordering, let me know, and I can reorder things. I try to do things based upon V one stuff first, and things that are basically ready to go before longer discussions that might rattle. Yeah, sure. That 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 shouldn't be a long discussion. That's my point. It should be cut and dry. Okay. Um. Well, let's see how far we get. I want to see if, see if we can make lots of things today. And just a reminder. Um. There I did it again. Pini <laughs> and Clemens, you guys have uh, two PRs that need update for V1 point, for the tri v v1.0 status or bucket. And again, we're, everybody agreed that we're still trying within hopefully about two weeks or so to get to the point where we at least do a release candidate for 1.0. All right, so with that, let's see if we can close this puppy today. Oh, before we get to the PRs, is there any other topic you guys wanna bring up before we get to the pull requests? All right, cool. So, Neil, just let me go here for a sec. Um, I, I have a couple of comments from yesterday, the, the content type. Yeah, I, so in my opinion, okay, between that and the fact that I think you're pulling in changes that obviously are not related to your stuff, I look at those as more just like syntax, or rebase issues that should not really affect whether we approve this or not, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd like to do is ask the group um, if they have any questions about this, if they have any concerns, because if not, what I'd like to do is conditionally approve this, assuming the editorial type changes can get made 
And then offline, if I can just get one or two LGTMs, we can merge this thing and not have to bring it up ever again. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask the question. Is there anybody on the call who's looked at this who has any concerns or questions that they want to bring up? Okay. Is there any objection then to approving this conditionally that we resolve some of these typographical type things and the, re and the rebase issues that, that, that have been seen in there? Excellent. Thank you guys very much. I know that wasn't a V.0 thing, but it's been out there for a long time. I didn't want to ignore it. So thank you, Neil, for all the hard work you put on that one. All right. Um, now this one from James is a V.0, a V10. However, I know Clements had a lot of opinions on this one, and since he's not on the call, and I don't believe James is on the call either, I'm inclined to defer this one, um, unless you guys have any really strong opinions you want to talk about that one right now. Okay, so let's defer that one. In that case, Klaus, you get to go next. Okay, so that's then the uh, pull request. Um, following the other one I had a few weeks ago regarding terminology, um, I think I, what I wanted to express here is that well, we ha have now this term intermediary and I wanted to use it now to make clear that intermediaries, um, well, <laughs> if they don't intend to uh, somehow modify or delete an attribute, are supposed to forward them. So that's exactly a nice discussion we had then as a follow-up to this pull request and in the comments. Um, how to express this best. I decided to, to just use the wording that was already there with this silently ignore and describe that um, uh, an intermediary for an intermediary silently ignoring an optional attribute means that it must forward it. Um, but yeah, so there have been some other proposals just to state, for example, that an intermediary um, uh, should or is strongly encouraged to uh, forward optional attributes or an intermediary that is not configured, explicitly configured to do otherwise uh, is, uh, must forward attributes. So there are several proposals in the comments right now. I think the other part in the primer I modified was mostly to introduce also the terminology. So with a producer, consumer and intermediary. And so I guess the biggest question is whether people are okay with the general direction of saying that intermediaries need to forward on uh, unknown or optional attributes. Right? Yes. Okay. So what do people think? Does that sound like the right general direction and it's just a matter of getting the right wording? Uh, since some of the comments are from me, I agree with the general direction. Okay. Anybody on the call have any concerns with the, with the direction? And just to let you guys know, that is consistent with other specifications such as the HTTP spec when it talks about proxies and stuff. It does talk about forwarding on uh, unknown stuff. Does it require forwarding them? Does it say must? No, it just should. Yeah, that's what I'm just thinking about here. Like, that's a pretty strong wording. Do we, do we, oh, we do have a definition for intermediary, okay. So we had, if we, for the must, it was only in case of this silently ignoring or if it's not configured to do otherwise. So, uh, because there might always be some use cases where an intermediary might somehow interfere with the attributes. But of course, we could just summarize it as a should. That's exactly the discussion. Yeah, I just, I, I don't get the meaning you are trying to convey with the additional word. Hello? 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 Okay, so maybe um, Klaus, what we could do is take the exact wordsmithing offline and and uh, maybe approve it offline um, if 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 we can get enough LGTMs. Otherwise, worst case scenario, we'll we'll revisit it again next week with the exact wording. Does that sound fair? I could just take over the the proposal you did in the comments. I think that was 
pretty much this should. Uh, what did I say? Oh, I, we, we, yeah, basically, I, I didn't give you the exact wording other than I said, okay, yeah, said they should. Yeah. That's true, okay. I mean, it could just be a matter of changing this must or should, right? Yeah, and then take out the silent ignoring and then just say intermediaries should forward uh, optional attributes or... Yeah, I, I don't think the silent yeah. ignoring adds anything at yeah. that point anymore. Yeah, that was just referring to the silently ignoring for consumers and producers. So just to say what this mean would mean for intermediaries, but I can just uh, simplify it. So it's fine. Yeah. So basically, I think what you're saying is this sentence would come down to something along the lines of intermediaries should forward basically all attributes. Yes. Yeah. Would are people okay with that general direction? It doesn't matter in the exact words. Okay, is there any objection then to working that offline? And I'll wait till we get uh, one or two LGTMs to make sure we didn't go off the rails. No objection, okay. Hold on. Um, okay, cool, thank you guys. Um, and thank you, Klaus. Let's see, next roadmap. So we don't necessarily have to approve this today if there's any pushback on it. There's no real hurry, um, other than I thought it might be good to actually modify the roadmap to actually align with our current plans. And basically what I said is the next milestone will be release candidate for 1.0. And our target for reaching that, or our, our, our criteria for reaching that would be to complete all issues and PRs tagged with 1.0 and decide on how long our verification and testing period is going to be basically how long between now and 1.0 and what the, um, what the what what we're going to do in that time period right in terms of making sure we actually feel like we have a solid spec um, and then to reach 1.0 we've completed all the criteria that we've defined up here and we have completed as many of the try for v1.0 tagged issues and PRs as possible there's no fixed amount it's just whatever we can get down the time period we'll, we'll get in there but thanks to um, Christoph's suggestion, I added some wording here that talked about how these changes are expected to be non-breaking changes in nature. Um, they're not meant to really change much of the semantics, maybe it's more of a clarification type stuff. Now that's not to say that <clears throat> as we do our verification testing, we, may, we won't introduce breaking changes. Obviously we can, because we haven't gone to 1.0 yet, but these try for 1.0 issues and, and PRs are meant to be more of clarification in nature more than anything else or additional binding specs. We have a couple of those in the, in the pipeline. And then in 1.0, I put in all the other stuff, you know, things that are not required for 1.0, process related issues and stuff like that. Definitely um, post 1.0 items. Anyway, any questions or comments on this? Uh, my question's on with the 1.1. .1. Mm -hmm. So if I see process related issues, or the, the question is more, um, if I have something on the wire that's 1.0 and there is no change for me because it's all process related issues that don't really affect what goes over the wire, um, then it's kind of, I don't really want that version change in that sense. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. So. Then, yeah. So, so to me, um, that's, I, don't know, I think that's what you're saying. So let's say, for example, we don't have any issues for, that are that actually go into the spec and all we ever do are process related issues. I think you're saying we actually might not release a 1.1. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I would agree. Um, I'll, let me take that action item to switch this and, and pull this out from under 1.1 and just say this, will be, this is a post 1.0 item, but it's not necessarily a version number type of thing. Let me work on that because you're exactly right. Yeah, I was thinking in the um, December thing, you have like the major, the minor, and the patch version. Mm -hmm. And what I'm thinking is that a patch version would never actually change something on the wire. So if you release a new patch, it sort of is a new version of the spec that you read, but on the wire, it doesn't have an effect. So on the wire, we just use the major and the minor. Does that make sense? 
It does. And maybe now that you're mentioning all this, maybe it would be, maybe it's a mistake for me to label this as 1.1 and I should find some other way to describe this as a TBD kind of a thing, because obviously based upon what we do in terms of issues to resolve, we may or may not have to go to 1.1 ever, or at least not for a long period of time and everything could be process related stuff. Right? So let me, let me rework this to be more of an, of a TBD type section and see if you guys can like the wording that I come up with. How's that? Can you, can you use either future or 1.0 plus? Yep, that kind of thing would work too, yes. Um, but just I, to make things more complicated, um, <laughs> how, about, how about extensions or well-known extensions? Does adding those affect the version? I wouldn't think so because they're not actually versioned. Uh, oh, that is true. Yes, that is true. Yeah, I don't think they're versioned. Uh, transports are though. So that, that, that's, kind of, that's gonna be kind of an interesting one. And maybe that's maybe we need to discuss that as part of you know this type of discussion or something like that. But I don't want to rattle on this because of other things. So let me do this. Are there any objections with the general direction I've headed here, in particular, in here? Okay, I'm not going to prove the PR. I'll work on work this section down here, and maybe we can talk about it again next week. But I definitely don't want to rattle on this one because this isn't worth it. Everybody knows where we're going conceptually. We just got to find out the right words to put it on paper. Okay, so let me work on that one. Um, where was I? Okay, now this one was an issue that was originally opened up by the other Doug. Now, um, I'm not gonna ask for vote on this because it was just opened a couple hours ago or maybe an hour or so ago, but I just wanna draw your attention to it and, and make sure, or I wanna get a sense for how people feel about the general direction. Um, basically, Doug was suggesting that we change the definition of the schema URL to allow for it to possibly uh, define constraints on other cloud event attributes besides just data. So for example, you may have a schema URL that points to a document that says, oh, by the way, type has to look like this. Um, if, and it's, it's just to, to make it clear that the schema that you're referring to isn't just about data. It could technically be about other things if they choose to talk about those other cloud event attributes. It seemed like a very reasonable thing to me. Um, and like I said, I don't want to vote it on today, but I wanted to get a sense from the group as to whether you guys are okay with that general direction or not. Because if not, then we'll go back and rethink it. Otherwise, we'll wait till next week to do a vote. Okay, uh, Jim, I think you might have gone up first. It's, so does this break the spirit of the separation of the data from the context a bit? That, that would be my only comment. I'm not anti it. I, I'm, I'm just concerned it's starting to couple things together, which I thought were meant to be somewhat independent. Um, I don't know how to respond to that one. Doug or anybody else want to respond to that one? Doug, you're coming off mute. Uh, I'll respond after uh, I think Christoph has his hand up. Okay, Christoph, you want to speak? Yeah, I also don't uh, get how it would. I don't get how it would work in practice. Let's say I have an XML document. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, Sorry agree with the, on I, um, I agree. I <laughs> um, agree. <laughs> The, what I don't get, let's say it's an XML, so I get an XML schema. So the XML would describe the XML document. How would that description refer to the type? Because the type is not part of the document that is being described in the XML schema. Yeah. Okay. This was my own main problem as well. Like it still says a link to the schema that the data attribute adheres to. How do you, how do you mix and match two different types of schemas for two different content types. Okay, Doug, you want to address that concern? Uh, am I off mute? Yes, you are. Okay. Um, well, I see this, uh, it, it was trying to utilize an existing attribute rather than to, um, to find another one, but it's about uh, utilizing uh, cloud events as a, an umbrella format where 
more domain specific schemas could be accommodated by it, but those domain specific schemas, like I'll give an example, um, uh, GS1, which has a event format called EPSIS, E-P-C-I-S, that's uh, really focused more on um, uh, location tracking of products and in the supply chain. Um, you know, they have a format that uh, could be accommodated in here, but the but it's more than just um, uh, the data attribute that would uh, have to conform to the EPSIS um, uh, schema. It would have to also um, utilize the other contextual attributes of cloud events in a certain way to ensure that it complied to anybody that was uh, producing or consuming those EPSIS events. Um, for example, with an EPSIS, the time uh, is a required attribute, not optional. Um, type would be, you know, if you look at the uh, cloud events um, attribute descriptions, there's, it, it's, it's very general. Um, it's intended to be that way to accommodate a lot of different use cases. Uh, and there's examples that are used under each of those attributes. And if you go, if you're adhering to a more constraining format, you want to lock down the, you know, what those, uh, those attribute values can be so that they can uh, accommodate that specific format. So it's beyond just data. So this, um, so, but, by extending this existing schema dot or schema URL attribute to accommodate other than just data, then it is moving it out of that uh, data, those data specific attribute categories. It's moving it up to the level of <clears throat> the cloud event version. Uh, you know, it's at that level. Does that help you guys who are asking questions or concerns? Okay, well, go no, ahead. I, say, I, 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 I get the intent, um, but I wonder if it, if it does sort of demand, much as I hate to say it, another context property to carry that. Otherwise, it just looks, I, I'm not quite sure what I would do with that and how I would interpret it. So my hands up, and I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm torn on this one as well um, for a couple of reasons. One is the, the URL that we're pointing to here, obviously in a lot of people's minds, I think they immediately jump to something like an XML schema doc where it's strictly, you know, an XSD file and, and that's all that's there. But technically this could point to just about anything. In particular, it could technically point to like a Word doc or a web page. And as part of that Word doc, it could have the XSD file. And that's what you're supposed to use to, to verify the, the shape of the data. Um, or actually, with, even within an XSD file, if you have a comment, it could have a comment there that says, oh, and by the way, if this payload is being sent as part of a cloud event, the type, the, the cloud event type attribute should look like this, or that the time attribute is no longer optional, it's not required, right? I, I don't know how I feel about that, but I could see that being how this can be done. So you're not necessarily breaking existing tooling that is assuming this only talks about the body, or I'm sorry, it's only talking about data. Um, but then other people understand that there are cases where it goes further, it knows what to look for to say, oh, okay, when it's part of a cloud event, here's the extra bit of information I need to know. I can, I can buy into that. It, it's a little bit of a squinting, but I could buy into that. Um, the, the other part that I really wanted to ask though about for, for Doug is whether the type itself could be used as this sort of schema thing that you're looking for. Because a lot of the cloud events that we're sending or all the cloud events we send, they don't have a type. And a lot of times they're prefixed with the same, you know, set of words um, or identifiers. For example, the GitHub stuff, they all start with com.github. And I'm wondering whether that alone should be sufficient for someone to be able to say, oh, I know that GitHub cloud events have these additional requirements because there's some document that says that. Therefore, I don't actually need to modify this URL. Just the prefix of the type would be sufficient for me to know those additional constraints. 
So anyway, those, those are sort of the things that are running to my head. I was wondering, Doug, if you had any comment on, on trying to reuse the, the prefix and the type would be sufficient for you. Uh, possibly. I just would say that the in in my envisioning of this, the, the type is one of the attributes that the schema would dictate what would be in, what would be how it would be structured. Yeah, I guess I'm asking to kind of flip the relationship around slightly rather than the schema pointing to the type. It's more like the type points to the schema, kind of. But anyway, okay, just, I was just wondering. Okay, Tapini? Yeah, just quickly. Um, I think uh, the first thing you were talking about, just pointing to a Word doc or doing comments inside a schema. Um, I myself am not enthused about encouraging that kind of behavior because I know that I would miss 99% of those um, either the whole schema or the specific comments about some other attributes in the cloud event because they're not machine readable. If someone adds a comment to their schema afterwards, um, I'm not going to notice it ever. Yeah. And the other thing is that the type does already dictate practically what you will find in the cloud event. That's just off the wire side channel communication. GitHub will most likely, um, document their own extensions, what they use and stuff like that. So that already happens. That's right. just not spelled out in doc. So that doesn't require changes in that sense. Right. So I, I think this is kind of right now it's considered that you would read GitHub's documentation if you use their cloud events instead of having a concrete scheme. And the point is that your schema within the payload might change without the documentation for the actual cloud event usage changing. And I think that um, th th this is only a problem because for me, it's also a bit unclear how much domain info you should be including in the context attributes. So how much of a strict schema should you have? Is it just contextual information about routing and stuff or does it also have domain information? Because subject does and source does, so. Yeah. Okay, I'll tell you what, um, I, uh, uh, Doug, do you want to respond to that? Okay, so I'll tell you what, um, since it's a very, very new PR, I just wanted to bring it to people's attention. Please go ahead and comment in the PR itself. Uh, I think all the comments people have made have been really, really good. Uh, let's see how much of an offline discussion we can have, and maybe we can figure out how we want to move forward on this one um, before next week's call. Um, but I, I just want to bring this one up to you guys' attention because this, I think, is the last PR tag with 1.0 as of right now. Um, so I want to make sure people pay attention to it and think about it. Okay. Otherwise, let's work it through the issue, or I'm sorry, through the PR itself. Um, but moving forward, what I wanted to do was see if we can get rid of these, or at least get rid of this one PR that's out there, this one issue that's out there, because this is tag with 1.0. A long time ago, Thomas from Google suggested or questioned whether we need both binary and structured formats. Um, I believe based upon everything I've heard in the group that there's enough people who like both. Um, for example, Tim AWS likes structured, uh, in particular the JSON. Um, I know, for example, there are other products out there that, for, for example, Knative, which uses the binary format, at least for the one bit of it that I play with a lot. Um, so it seems to me that it would be a mistake for us to drop one of them entirely. Um, and that's not to say that we couldn't change our specifications, because I think some of the specs right now require, like the HTTP, I think it requires the receivers to support both. We could change that requirement if we wanted, but I think it's a different issue. Relative to this particular issue about the option of dropping one of the two, I think it'd be a mistake for us to do so. So I'm proposing that we close this with no action and leave both in our specifications. Any comments on that, Tapini? Yeah, just a quick question. I have been thinking about this. I didn't even know about this issue, but what, why does Knative use the binary mode? Scott, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, uh, we use binary mode because we are strictly HTTP and to make a, an HTTP request compatible with cloud events, it's just adding headers instead of changing the body. 
if you change the body of the request, you have to change how everything actually consumes the event. That is a great point. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say that that is the exact reason I've been very enamored with the binary mode, right? If you have an existing message flowing around, I don't have to change my code that processes it anymore. All I have, is, all I have are just extra headers that I may or may not want to deal with. Nothing else changes. I love that. So, anyway. Yeah, I haven't even thought about that. That's pretty great, actually. Yeah. So, um, anyway, the proposal is in front of the group to close this issue with no action. Any concerns or questions on that? Is there any objection to closing with no action? Okay, like I said, if you guys want to revisit the decision to require both uh, receivers to support both, in particular for HTTP, feel free to open an issue. I still think that's a valid question. Uh, whether I agree or not is a different topic, but I think it's a valid question. Okay, uh, this one, Christoph's help with that's when we need to talk about that one. Um, okay, Clemens isn't here, but let me see if this one is in a state where we could quickly approve it, because I think he addressed everybody's concerns. Let me just see. Yeah. So I don't think he made any material changes since last week. I think he maybe, maybe just made some minor syntactical editorial type changes here. I'll give you guys just a second to review and refresh your memory about what he said here. Are there any questions on this or concerns with this? And keep in mind, this is just the primer, so it's non-normative. Okay. Is there any objection to approving this? Cool. Thank you, guys. No, sorry. Too shortly. Doesn't that... <laughs> I'm so sorry. Go ahead. That doesn't that conflict a bit the transport binding and the event format encoding sections because the event format encoding section should define how the information model of the base specification together with the chosen extensions is encoded for mapping but actually for example in the case of the binary encoding oh that's a different encoding i guess okay maybe i'm wrong so the http binary encoding does actually the event format encoding part in the transport binding. So it doesn't match this architecture. So wait, wait, okay, you lost me. Which part doesn't match? So, so the HTTP binary encoding is, as far as I remember, defined in the HTTP transport binding, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that is that that being there doesn't conform to this architecture description because the event format encoding is a separate thing here. Um, I'm not quite sure I follow. The binary encoding decides how the information model is encoded instead of a different event format. Oh, are you suggesting that somewhere in here it should say for the structured format? Yeah, I guess so. Because the binary encoding doesn't follow this architecture. It's transport binding specific. Mm. Do me a favor, uh, make a comment to that effect somewhere yeah, here okay. and then we'll hold off. Yeah, it's just a bit. I don't think it, it's not that like major. It's not important. It's well, let me, okay, well, let me put it this way. Would you prefer to get that resolved before we merge this, or would you like to f have a follow-on PR? I, I think it's fine to have a follow-on. Okay, do me a favor, then open up a pull request to do that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. And, and actually, just a reminder of everybody, especially when it comes to things like the primer, um, feel free to make edits and additional PRs as you see fit. Uh, none of the stuff is probably perfect as of right now, so we're always looking for PRs to, to fix wording and stuff like that. All right, uh, let's see. All right, this one, um, been out there for a little while. Uh, this one was, um, somebody opened up an issue saying that it was a little unclear about what the type attribute actually related to. Um, 
And so what I did is I opened up a pull request here to make it clear um, that it's relating to the original occurrence and it's not necessarily the type of the cloud event itself. It's a type of the original occurrence event thingy. And that's what I was just trying to convey here. And during that discussion we had, I think two weeks ago when we talked about this, um, I originally had some text that talks about how a single occurrence could result in more than one event. And I actually had that text down here and it was a little confusing because it kind of implied that type varies only when you have multiple occurrences and that wasn't the intention. So I moved it, that little sentence up here into the definition of event to make it clear that a single occurrence may result in more than one event. That way it's not tied to the type stuff anymore. So I don't think I actually changed anything from last time we looked at this. I just moved the sentence around to not imply a linkage between the two. Are there any questions on this? Any objection to approving this? This is the only normative change technically. And this is just explanatory text. Any objection? I'm good. All right, cool. Thank you guys. Oops. All right, Eric. Um, do you think this one's ready to go or are you and are you and Clemens going back and forth still? I haven't heard from Clemens since my last comment, so I don't know. Um yeah, I, I'm a little nervous about, about doing it without him here because he may have just been on vacation or something recently. So are you okay with us deferring this till next week? That seems entirely reasonable. Okay. okay. I'll fix that. All right, next one. <clears throat> so Thomas from Google a long time ago opened up a, this PR originally and then it kind of lingered. Um, and since he's off doing some other exciting stuff, I decided to follow through on it for him. Uh, basically what he's talking about here is uh, trying to add some text to the primer that makes it clear that transport level information is not meant to go inside of the cloud event itself. In particular, the uh, transport level routing information. So there's a little paragraph here, just I think, what section was this one? Okay, that's just part of design goals. Okay, um, so basically he introduces the notion of metadata transport level information not being part of the cloud event spec, and then he points you down to the non goal section, which gives a much more detailed explanation here. And I'll give you guys just a second to look that over, just in case you haven't read it recently. Okay, uh, again, keep in mind this is just in the primer. Is there any questions or concerns about this general direction or the, with the text here? Okay, is there any uh, objection to approving it then? And I'll pick on Tapini. <laughs> oh God, not again. <laughs> well, you're the one that keeps speaking. In, in this I, mean, I know, I'm taking Clemens to stroll down that he's in. <laughs> Exactly. Oh my gosh. Um, I think this is a pretty good rewording. It addresses all the concerns I have raised with the PR. Okay. Anybody else have any concerns or questions? Okay, last chance. Any objection? No objection. All right, thank you guys. Just, just a typo I posted in chat, otherwise oh. it's cool. Where, 138? Uh, 138 is tr transport, not transport. Okay. Yeah. I will fix that. Thank you very much. Let me make a note of that. Approved. Typo. Got it. Okay. Um, Fabio is not on the call, but have people had a chance to look at his Avro spec? I think um, there's some minor syntax things. That should be full, zero, 0 0.4 work in progress. But aside from that, it looked good to me, but I know nothing about this protocol. So I was looking at this straight from a cloud event perspective. Anybody have any comments, questions? Okay. Do people want more time or should I ask for a vote? Heinz. 
Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering, uh, do we really need to do all these mappings for uh, the spec? Because it, op it might open a can of worms where Avro, yes, is very popular, but uh, there are actually quite a few industry standard uh, mechanisms for serialization, deserialization. Uh, might kind of be opening a can, can of worms here. Is that a good or a bad thing, though? That's a bad thing. <laughs> where you know you'll start getting hundreds of requests for, well, what's the what's the spec mapping for? I don't know. Uh, you know, there's a whole litany of them, and uh, you just may not want to open that door, right? So let me, let me poke on that a little. Why would that necessarily be a bad thing? Uh, it'll be potentially, uh, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of requests for mapping to different uh, serialization capabilities. You know, everything yeah. from Google protocol buffs to cryo to, you know, uh, you know, the list just goes on and on and on and on. But isn't that a good thing? Is that an indication that people want to use it in other bindings? But if it's a binary binding, you're already going to be doing that serialization part of your application and then attach it as a binary attachment. So if it's a binary attachment that's really outside of the, uh, you know, the cloud event spec, that would be again, back to, I would bind it and somewhere in the header, I'd indicate perhaps that this is an Avril binding, but uh, I may want to actually put what, you know, all kinds of additional things into it and I probably wouldn't be worrying about serialization of things such as headers, right? So this would be purely application specific. At least I believe it would be. A Tapini? Um, I think that's more of a question of whether the SDKs or the user should do the mapping into the format. As it's currently stated, I think the, how do the SDKs do it now? If you want to send JSON, JSON do, the, do they construct the JSON for you? Uh, do you have to do it yourself? I, I believe that, well, I think the Java SDK serializes the event for you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the Go one does too. And if that's the goal, then I think we do need to have the event formats because the SDKs will need the specification. Um, I think it's more of a question whether we should allow someone to just insert, or if the SDK should probably just allow someone to put whatever they want there. If, if it's not supported, the event format they need. Heinz, does that answer your question? Or your concern? Um, not exactly, but I'm, I'm going to have to think about this one a bit more, where again, it, uh, I was always under the impression, and again, the JSON is completely different, um, where if I need to serialize that, it's all going to be very simple string serialization, because that's all for the JSON, right? But if you are actually creating some custom payload, that uh, you will be defining that serialization, and you don't, right? So if I have the payload serialized as maybe an, a, uh, a cryo serialization, do I then want to wrap that again into, you know, an Avro serialization before I actually send all this stuff, right? This wouldn't affect the payload, right? This is about wrapping the actual cloud events. But this is the point when I'm wrapping those cloud events um, are we going to specify how you wrap those for serialization? Does it really matter? Because if I'm doing a binary transfer, the cloud event information is in the header. It's not in the payload, which is what I'm sending, right? So, okay. My reading of what, of what where we're headed here is you, your concern isn't about this particular proposal itself. It's a higher level issue. And sure. right, and, and so can I ask you to open up an issue to have that discussion in the issue itself? Because I don't sure. think it's necessarily fair to pick on the on Fabio's PR to have this discussion without them on the call. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I think, given the current path that we're on, 
we should accept this pull request on its merits and then leave the higher order discussion that you want to talk about separate because i think if if for example you're correct and we should uh, do something different than just have a open up the floodgates and get tons of bindings in, in, into our into our domain then i think that's going to radically change what we do with all these specs right for example we may decide to kill them all and do something different right um but i think that's a bigger discussion we have separate of uh, from this current path that we're on so i'd like to have people evaluate this particular pr in, uh, as, as a standalone decision yeah but this is actually um, part of, I think, the confusion comes back into all of this is the lack of examples other than HTTP for the transport binding to the actual, um, you know, SDK. So, for example, in the Java SDK, we have taken the, well, at least they've done a good job of saying, here I have an object that represents all the parts I need to do to form a cloud event. But if I'm doing a, a, a binary transport binding, to, for example, AMQP, I still have to form that AMQP message, which is separate from all the header properties that I put in according to the specification. The header properties are going to be serialized based on the libraries for AMQP, not cloud events or any cloud event definition. And the payload is just going to be the, the actual message event itself, which I don't see that you would actually take the entire event object and send that, which will include all the stuff that's in the header and the payload. Or is that what we really are expecting? Because that is not my understanding of the spec. Maybe I'm missing a fundamental part here that when I do a non-HTTP transport binding, all the cloud event stuff is in the header and the message payload is just the payload, which is the event, and the header describes what is that event, right? Okay, so I'm gonna have to, unfortunately, <clears throat> given time constraints, I have to call time. With the, the, um, can I, so the, yeah, the Go SDK shows examples of doing the binary and structured encoding for AMQP. It also does structured encoding for NATS, and it does binary and structured encoding for PubSub as well as HTTP. Okay, has that been added recently? Because it's been a while since I looked at it and it was only HTTP. Well, it, it is completely rewritten now. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll, I'll go back and revisit it before I do the issue because that will clear up my concerns. Okay, cool. Okay, so Dan, I got you, thank you. Um, okay, so we are at the top of the hour. So I think, Jem, you put a comment into the chat saying you're asking for more time. I assume it was related to this issue or this PR. So. Um, Okay, so yeah, so we won't we won't push on this PR, but please do take a look at it. I would like to get this one in next week if possible, because I don't think there's anything that controversial in there, aside from Heinz's higher order issue, which you said you'll open up an issue about. So with that, let me go back and do a final roll call. Um, let's see, Javier, are you still there? Yes. Okay, and Jem, I got you. Uh, William, are you there still? No, I lost William. What about Glenio? I don't see them on call, or Gilbert? Okay, is there anybody I missed for roll call? Okay, um, in that case, thank you guys very much. And if you're on the SDK team, please stick on the call because that call started a minute ago. <laughs> Everybody else, you're free to go. Thank you guys very much for a very productive call. Am I later or early? Yeah, I don't know, you're both. <laughs> or we're all both. All right. Of course, that's okay, Jim. You can even unmute yourself if you want to. All right, let me switch. I'm going to lurk a bit, but I'm probably not going to unmute myself anymore. <laughs> You're so funny. Uh, uh, -da. Unfortunately, we were supposed to talk about Clements' PR. And with him on, on the call, it's going to be a little harder, so we may have to skip that one. All right, let's see, Klaus, you're still there, good. Um, so Klaus, you want to talk about your comment here? Um, yes, I have also to uh, recall what exactly it was about, but um, I think I was doing some um, recap of, um, well, 
you know, at, when we were preparing the demo for um, KubeCon, we were in a rush and, and I was now looking into the issues I, I ran into over that preparation. And I think, yeah, exactly. So um, I, I just saw in the, in the Go SDK um, that, I mean, we, we just had this switch from um, this string representation, I think. So uh, for JSON, I think, oh, what was it exactly? It was something. So I think the, the strings were, ah, and, and the HTTP headers um, were supposed to be JSON encoded before, and we switched that to uh, string representation and that was um, over those uh, types we the type discussion I think and I, I just stepped over it because in the Go SDK I saw some lines of code where um, for HTTP headers I think at least for extensions uh, the the JSON dot um, Marshall uh, routine was called and um, so and. I, I saw a few more things where I wondered if, if that was um, implemented the same way in all SDKs and if it wouldn't make sense to have something like common uh, test cases, test events, and, and to, to check maybe in unit tests in the according SDKs if uh, they all work the same. Just to make sure I understand the, the issue that you're talking about. Um, did, do we say anything about um, encoding or, or, or escaping things? Or do we just say, take the value, it's a string, and just stick it in there? I think that was also, you have, um, it was about double quotes also, I think. Um, I, uh, there was one issue in, in the Go SD, for the Go SDK opened up. I was, um, Yeah, so we had this discussion that um, if we represent types correctly in, in HTTP headers, then we have uh, for strings, we would have double quotes to determine that it's a string, I think. Mm -hmm. And we, we changed it so that we now have um, just say that everything has its canonical string representation. And um, yeah, so that's what I said in, on the Slack channel. I just wonder if those recent changes are already uh, um, uh, reflected well in all the SDKs because I saw in the Go SDK it wasn't yet done. I mean, it was very fresh, that change. And and, um, and I said it because I, I think that might be handy to have some common uh, test events to, to send and receive uh, those SDKs and see if they all work the same with those SDKs. Okay, so I think I understand where you're headed with this. So, because originally I, when, you, when, you, when you pasted this issue to Slack to me or wherever it was, mm -hmm. um, I thought maybe you were wondering whether there was a problem with the spec, but really you're just concerned that perhaps all the SDKs are not adhering to the changes we made in 03, and so you just want test cases or some sort yeah, of verification, yeah. right? So that was some example. I, I just realized, I mean, that's always, you can discuss spec uh, all the time, but once you, you start doing uh, the, the actual implementation, you run into a lot of subtleties and, and, and uh, wonder if, if that's handled the same way in all SDKs. Another wow. thing uh, might be the discussions around the map type. So I, I, in the in the Go SDK, I, I think I saw some unit tests that had some nested types, and um, yeah. So I was just wondering if that's really consistently handled in all SDKs. One one note about the SDK, the Go SDK, and map types is uh, I've chosen to not uh, continue to nest the map types because I think the spec is wrong. So I only go one level down. Okay. Yeah, that's what I, what I realized. And okay, so that that that's then um, intention. Okay. 
Scott, um, I'm sorry, can you elaborate? What do you mean by you only go one level down? If you give me a map that's a nested map of maps of maps, I only, I only pop out one map level. Oh, does the spec say you should do multiple? The spec says you should go as far as the maps go down. And I say, that's wrong. Ooh, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like, I don't like the entire thing we do in general. That's even worse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Those are exactly the, the cases I wanted to bring up or maybe uh, encourage that we, we have a collection of, of bad examples somewhere. I mean, yeah. of, of really tough events with edge cases. So, so Scott, do you think that the current set of issues that we have opened up cover that particular case, or do you think, for example, James is focused on a different aspect? No, it's it's covered in the uh, conical hard eventing encodings as the issue that's posted in the comments from Tipini. Okay, because because Evan opened up a pull request, but he didn't make any change to the spec. He just wanted to list some some gotchas to watch out for. Yeah. It, the that shows that the, the spec has some holes. Okay, because I'm trying to figure out how we go about getting those changes made to the spec. It, did we, can one of you guys open up an issue or a pull request or something to, to make sure we cover this topic? Because it sounds like kind of a big one. Are you talking about the maps in binary yes. encoding? Yes. Um, the, the, so, so the issue for me in the call that we didn't get to was it's basically morphed into that issue done. You even made a comment about changing the <laughs> changing the spec. Is it this one? The one below. Oh, gotcha. Okay. You you even just made a comment about how to fix this issue. Then. You expect me to remember that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Five uh, hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's way too long ago. Okay. Okay, so we do have an issue out there. Okay, that's good. So we will at least talk about it at some point. This, however, to me, okay, this is tag with 1.0, so that's good. Okay, so we will talk about this at some point. Cool. Okay, so, okay, so there's two aspects of this one then. There's one is that issue that we just were talking about, but then there's how do we do testing to make sure everybody's correct. What do you guys want to do about testing? Because I know this has come up before, like in this 381 issue. How do you guys want to address that? I think that actually might be part of this testing and verification period that we're talking about doing before we go 1.0. Is it someone take the, the action item to come up with some sort of test harness or at least maybe a test client or something like that? So at one point I, I actually had a part of one. Uh, the trouble is you, you, Unless you leverage like the a golden SDK, you have to rewrite an entire SDK. We we possibly could do this with like pre canned responses that are hand edited, and just send it and then expect a certain response or something. Uh, but I I started writing one. I realized it was exactly the code that I was writing for the SDK, and I stopped. Hmm. I was thinking exactly about that too, yes. So um, could we perhaps start by just collecting? Uh, I mean, if we are working on SDKs and, and do debugging, maybe we create some test events to, to track down some issues. Yeah, I, th I, think the, I think the right answer is to make a f small framework that is specific for a transport that you can record or create new uh, encodings on the wire. And then you send that to the cloud event or to the S SDK configured with a certain transport. So just kind of like pre-canned messages. I think this would probably get us pretty far. So how do you verify that the receiver, the, re the receiving SDK actually parsed it correctly? We would have to have a conical form of the event on the other side. Hmm. Force our way to spit it out in XML and make sure the XML matches. Oh. <laughs> well, now we need a new laptop because I peeped all over it. Oh. <laughs> but I mean, like, if you spit out JSON, for example, because every transport supports JSON, like, sh show me what the JSON representation of the event that you received is. That's easy to compare. Yeah, the one, it's funny. I know I was, it was a half joke, though, but the reason I picked on XML was because. 
I'm pretty sure no one supports it today. And the last thing I want to have someone do is to say, oh, I'm passing the test because I support structured mode and I just echoed what I got. Yo, I support JSON. Or sorry, XML. Do you? I do. Excellent. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, okay. I even have tests. <laughs> so how do you guys want to move forward on this? We should make a task force to to make a, cl a client library that you can direct it at a, uh, an SDK or a running service and say, like, verify that you get all these messages. And like, what, th what exactly that means is TBD. So in other words, it, 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 every SDK needs to have a client uh, echo server that will parse it and then retransmit it back out? I would say more every SDK has to provide a, a, an application that you could point at and uh, get, get this result. Like it doesn't have to be part of the SDK, but it has to be part of a thing that's implemented by the SDK that you're referring to right but but it would be up to the the, the test framework to uh, see what it sent and validate it against what it received right the that's right the test framework would expect like a file to be written to the local disk or something yeah or just yeah if you want to if you want your guide if you want your sdk to be to participate in the test, you got to provide us with two URLs. One is the URL to send the event to, and the other URL is to do a get to see what the results are in whatever format that may be. Take on XML as an example, right? That way the tester can do a get, let's see how you can do a, a post followed by a get, and you should be able to verify the results. Yeah. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, that's, and that's easy enough. Anybody could participate then. You could host that anywhere on the web so people can right. test whatever they want. As a note, to combat the echo problem, you send the events as in one format and read it in another. So yeah. for every single event format you send, you verify the conversion into every other event format that the SDK supports and check the responses each way. Yeah. You have to, hmm. it gets tricky with other transports though. It's like, if you want to verify that you received something on AMQP, you, you have to know it's both its AMQP address and its uh, give me the result URL. Is that that but hard? Isn't this about encoding? Oh, but binary encoding, right. But is that really a problem though, Scott? I mean, if I give you a, a URL, it starts with AMQP colon something, and then I give you an HTTP URL for the check the result thing, is that is that really an issue? But let's table that. There's There's a lot of details there. Like okay. Credentials and things like that. Oh, well, yeah, it's I was just... right, but it's it's non-trivial. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like it, this isn't necessarily that hard to do. It's just a matter of the first step. If someone needs to actually write down the structure of this entire testing framework, and then if we all agree with it, we can go off and implement whatever is necessary. Is there some? Is there somebody who wants to take the first pass, just writing down what the framework looks like? I, I have half of one if no one else wants to volunteer. I just heard a volunteer. Okay. <laughs> can I get it's a new Or I, I guess I can stage it on my personal. Uh, <clears throat> we could create a test repo, I think. Give me a name uh, and I'll create a repo for you to do something. Uh, um, SDK test? Cloud event compliance? Something shorter. Compliance? Compliance. I'll do that. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll do that. Cool. Verification or, yeah, some, some word that means, like, test me. <laughs> well, we could just call it test. Uh, that, uh, no, two, it's, two. It's, yeah, it's not really. Oops. Okay, we'll do compliance for now. We always rename it. We, we should, let's be more international friendly. What, what is the German word for compliance? House. That's a good question. Um, 
<laughs> um, direct translation, I, I don't know. <laughs> we are so used to, 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 the, to using the word compliance. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not sure. Beachtung, I don't know. <laughs> but let's keep compliance. Yeah, I had no idea yes. what that would mean. Yeah. Okay. Thank, good try, Scott, but no. <laughs> Although, if you really want to mess with people, let's go for where is it? Chinese. Yeah, well, that's what I was that's exactly what I was thinking for. Chinese. That, yeah, how's that? There we go. Do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one will ever know what it's about, except the Chinese folks. Okay. Anyway. Um Okay, so I think we addressed those classes. Is there anything else on your issue that we need to talk about? Um, well, um, maybe that we can do that in the same repository, probably uh, just collect a first uh, list of sample events or, or good candidates for testing. I don't know. Yep. Makes sense. And that's where I think Evan's PR is going to come into play. Yep. Or how about, how about conformance? That's, that's better, I think. Anybody object to conformance? Because then we could write a framework and then we could list examples. That's fine. Any objections to conformance? Done. Cool. That's right. also the same. Yeah, way. Sorry, Jim has his hand right. up. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. You're right. Jim, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, just a, a general comment. Um, how are the SDKs meant to be aligning with the SDK? primer or spec that I guess Clemens put together um, and and also I understand obviously that Jason needs to be supported out of the box but I'm curious how some of these SDKs are expecting to work with something like protobuf where they've defined the you know the entire event format is defined in proto so I'm I'm a little bit curious about what the thought process is there. Um, I can see in Clemens's thing, he's got, you know, providing marshallers for the data payload. Um, I assume you also need marshallers for the extensions as well so that they can go into headers. Um, so uh, I'm, I, I'm just trying to understand where we're going with that stuff um, because I, I think as a company, we're on the verge of starting to actually code to cloud events um, but from what I can gather our engineers are not looking at the SDKs at the moment and I'm not entirely sure why um, but I, I wanted to understand your guys direction very, very, very open-ended I'm afraid yeah I haven't I haven't attempted proto yet but um, it's not impossible you can technically provide your own transport and you can provide your own content. I call them codecs where you inspecting the, the media type of the incoming request for HTTP or the data content encoding for the cloud event. You can see what, what the data encoder should be. And so you can select a decoder that matches. Right. I, uh, that was, that was Scott. Yeah. Um, I, I guess what I'm saying is that in the spec, it sort of says you should define a cloud event object. So, so though the SDKs have gone yeah. uh, and created a cloud event object representation in some cases, but when you talk about something like uh, Proto, then you, you, all you really want to do is layer um, an accessor or something over the top of the generated proto model yeah your, your SDK is not going to own the the proto definition so I, I yeah I, it's just a struggle for me to understand how these would work and especially when you throw in Avro which is coming and then uh, I think uh, we were talking about other binary schemes as well um, just yeah just trying to get a sense of direction and um, is the SDK spec um, uh, meant to be adhered to from a pattern perspective, or is it just a, um, a best practice sort of document? I've been ignoring the SDK uh, document that Clemens wrote. Is that because you think it's wrong or you just having a time to see what's in it? I think it's an opinion that 
does not apply to how every language is composed. Hmm. Yeah, and that, that I guess is, is the interesting point. Yeah, but I mean, presume you follow a similar pattern, yeah? Or, or are you sort of saying, no, it's not idiomatic, so it doesn't make sense in my situation? Yeah, it's, it's not idiomatic. The general thought process I've been using for the Golang SDK is that you're, you deal in the cloud event structure, so that higher level object, and you never ever think about the transport. And so you interact with this client, and then under the covers, the transport does its job. But you never ever see that. Like the only time you actually see it is when you create the original client that you're using to send and receive. Yeah, I think Clemens takes a very different approach, right? Yes. And what's interesting is, from my perspective, I always thought both approaches were valid. Um, but I, to be honest, I was I also haven't checked the SDK doc to see whether his, whether that doc sort of forces you down the Clemens path or not. It kind of does, which is why I've been ignoring it. Interesting. Well, that's something we should probably get fixed then, um, because if 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 we have at least one SDK author who disagrees with the doc and it, you're doing stuff that isn't consistent with it, then that kind of, it, it, in my mind, it makes the doc, the SDK doc kind of pointless, and we should either make the SDK doc align with what you guys are doing, with, 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 with what's actually being implemented, or kill the doc because it doesn't provide value. I think the each SDK should be the domain expert on the language that they're using, and every language would do something very different. So I, if I remember correctly, one of the reasons we came up with the SDK doc was because someone at some point said, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could have some level of consistency across uh, the various languages or across the SDKs? Do you think that that's a pipe dream and it, and it actually can't be done because there are so many differences and, and you want things to look more native and, and so trying to get consistency is actually going to hurt that? I, I think it's if you're trying to get consistency around how you compose each language, it's, uh, I, I don't think that's a goal. At hmm. least it's not a goal for the SDK for Go. Okay, interesting. Because it doesn't really make any sense. And in fact, like the, the SDK document says that basically any object at any state, uh, any object that represents a cloud event should be valid in, in any state in, in, in memory which is completely untrue for Go because it's not possible. What does that mean? Okay. Not, that, not that it's not possible. What is, what is Clemens looking for? I can't remember. I don't know exactly. I, I think he's, he's assuming like some very big structure around factories and conversions and marshalling. And so the, you always get a valid event. But I don't understand how you would assemble an event because like as you're assembling it you either need to make a, a builder pattern and at the final thing you say build and you get a, a valid event and you're only interacting with the builder but that's not how go works hmm. okay maybe i need to go back and reread the doc again okay that's interesting but it sounds like a good topic for us to have on the next call with with clemens on so Okay, but we actually only have four minutes left on this call, and I wanted to, I wanted to be able to touch on your on your subject, Scott. You said responses to events. What did you want to talk about there? Yeah. Uh, so the, I've been working with uh, Alan Conway. I don't know if he's on the call. Let's see. No, he's not. So he he's trying to push down some very big changes in the Golang SDK to make it um, kind of unidirectional by default, oh, okay, sorry, okay, let me step back. His general concern is that there's been some misunderstanding about the, the Cloud Events SDK in, in regards to an event shows up and it is expected potentially that you can have a response. So this is very true in HTTP and it's actually a very useful property because you don't need to have any, you don't have to have the next stage wired up. You can have an invoker that goes and invokes a function with a cloud event and that produces um, a new event potentially. It doesn't have to be as like 
as a response to that event in the terms of the sender of the original event intends to receive this response. It's more, we, in, so in Knative, we use this mechanism to do filtering. So if an event goes into a function, the function can act as a filter. The response then gets forwarded onto the next stage if there is one. And if there isn't one, that event chain gets filtered out. Or that filter has the chance to mutate that event or potentially make multiple events. But this is only a feature of HTTP. And so there's probably some guidance required from the Cloud Events SDK, sorry, the uh, Cloud Events spec to talk about how can you leverage this feature of HTTP, but also have it apply to every other transport. This is not possible in AMQP unless you give it a response topic. Anyway, well, I can't. go ahead, Jim. No, I was going to say, aren't you sort of you're sort of drifting into, you know, dare I say, ESB territory at that point, aren't you? Where you you're more trying to define interactions than just in co transport encodings, which. Do you see what I mean? Are you trying to you're trying to put behavior over the top? Is, is that a higher that. order function than an SDK? I guess that's the question. So I have a client, and it some transports support this mechanism of having a response, and some don't. So I made the choice that the the top level interface has this optional piece you can. Yeah. You can say I accept responses and I, or I produce responses. Most of the transports in the Golang SDK ignore this field because it's not actually supported by that transport. So this question comes up. So you can't decouple behavior from the transport if you're talking about an SDK. I'm, I apologize. I'm, I'm not quite sure I completely get it in terms of is this a spec issue or an SDK issue? Well, I think it becomes a pattern issue, doesn't it? I mean, you know, much as Scott might want to disregard Clemens's SDK document, I, that's the sort of stuff that would go in there, yeah, to define um, the expected contracts. So, Scott, it sounds like you're saying, okay, I demarshal something off the wire. I give it to somebody to do something with, but is it my job to send a response back or is it somebody else's job? Well, the, it, because I own the, the HTTP request that's opened, I'm invoking you in a callback. I, the SDK is responsible for responding to that, uh, that callback. So the callback has the opportunity to re return a an HTTP response because that's where the request is open. I, I apologize. I actually need to jump off to another call. You guys can stay on because I don't own the, the Zoom thing. You guys can continue and just take notes in there, but I, I need to jump off. I apologize. Somebody's pinging me. See you then. Okay. Bye, guys. Yeah, I need to drop off too. Thanks. So, Scott, I, I, I see your point, but the way I sort of, as I said, I've not spent a lot of time with the SDKs yet, but I sort of viewed them as they would be wrapped by something else. Yeah, so um, I don't know. I'd have a JAX RS endpoint that, that I would code and it would go, oh, I've, I've hit this endpoint, therefore I'm going to use this SDK function to... Um, demarshal my HTTP request That's rather right. than it rather than expecting the SDK to actually own that JAX or, or, or that actual endpoint protocol it's literally just a transport bind maybe do you see what I mean I maybe I'm not explaining myself very well but that, it, that's also so, sorry to interject um, it, that depends a lot on the language though so. true yeah no i get it i i get it so for example for javascript there isn't a single um for node.js specifically there isn't a single um 
format for HTTP request, you could give the, the SDK. If it doesn't know the client, then it doesn't know the format of the headers, for example. Right. You, you, then you would have to have separate separate marshallers for different okay, okay. HTTP clients and stuff, and that, that becomes a very but, problematic, I think. But aren't you going to have that problem anyway? I mean, this is a, the, the double-edged sword with SDKs. Yeah, I mean, the, I don't know. We as a company may have said, no, we're not allowed to use that particular construct for vulnerability purposes or whatever. Yet the SDK actually uses those. I mean, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that there's any way around that. Um, but it, that, it's sort of, that is a good point. You run into dependency problems where you sort of the, the low level SDKs are starting to drag in, um, you know, other dependent libraries. Yeah. You know? That's true. That's true. So I've been, I've been writing this thing to, uh, the client wraps the transports, but you can use the transports directly or you can choose to use just the codex that the transports use. And if you want to do all the work of marshalling yourself, you can use the HTTP codec and, and you get the same result. Right. So may maybe this is a the bigger question then, you know, as an SDK writer, am I required to be unopinionated and make it more complicated so that people can plug in their own bindings or whatever or am i allowed to be extremely opinionated and say nope this is the way that uh that i marshal stuff um and you know it's on me i do think it would be good for the official sdks to provide and if they do provide an opinionated approach as got has argued for which i think is correct um they should provide also the option of you know doing the transport yourself because of exactly those for example company policy issues that you might not be able to affect in any way um yeah mm -hmm. and that's also something that's got talked about so i mean both are better but for someone just doing a random cloud event supporting sdk i don't think it makes sense to require both. They can do yeah. only opinionated stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, just no reason, in my opinion, to make the um, what's the word here? Um, make it harder to start making an, your own SDK or your own cloud event supporting client. Yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. So um, my my goal has been uh, kind of edging towards uh, function as a framework using the Go SDK library. So it's very easy to become a producer and a consumer of cloud events. Uh, and you potentially don't even understand the transport underneath. Yeah, I actually have a similar thing for Kafka that came to existence before cloud events in our company that will be ported to cloud events and supporting multiple transports once mm -hmm. the spec is 1.0. And I do think that's actually a great approach. But I, I also think like it would be pretty weird not to have a, if it's considered an official SDK to not have a more low level, low level codec endpoint that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. I, I, it, I have three layers. There's the client, there's the transport, and then there's the codec. And the codecs are transport uh, dependent. Why? Because the, I've made an abstraction between the codec and the transport where the, the codec and the transport communicate with a transport message, which has the the necessary required fields to produce the message on the on the wire like for http it's uh, headers and body for amqp it's headers content type and body for pubsub it's attributes and data right so does the codec handle both event encoding and the transport marshalling yes so Okay. 
Okay, so you just put them into one, and that's why you need to have transport specific codecs. That's yeah, yeah. Well, it, I, I guess that's fine. I, I was just like now that the there's the PR for architecture section on the primer, and it like I was actually thinking more on those lines, you know, having a separate JSON codec and the transport marshaller, then you don't need to have 15 different JSON codecs, just one, but 15 different transport level. Right, yeah, so I, I share marshals. That. Um, the JSON, like structured encoding is shared among all the transports, but each have independent binary transport encodings. Because oh yeah, sure, yeah. For header values and things like that, and how you pop that out of the transport message. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking about. That's the issue I've been, I tried to bring up with the architecture PR, where um, the binary encodings just don't conform to that PR's view they're, of the architecture. Yeah, they're pretty, um, it's, it's fairly noisy, especially when you start adding extensions. It's, uh, yeah, I, I find it hard how we should, about, or I've been thinking about a little bit about the the combination of canonical string encodings, yeah. uh, the need for binary encodings, and the fact that the binary encoding would require a codec per transport makes a pretty uh, yeah. hard combination to crack. It's true. But uh, for HTTP, I, I think you, you have to. Otherwise, you have to rewrite every client library that consumes the host. Yeah, yeah, I got the Knode example. That's that was a really good example. I, like, there's no reason not to have that when that's the case. Yeah. All right. I also have to run. Um, yeah, me too. Well, but yeah, if, hey, uh, Jim, if you would like to play with the GoLang SDK, please do. Let me know what you think. I will try and have a look. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Bye. Bye.